We still do seven NUFC Matters show a week for free. But if you want to help support NUFC Matters, then there are a few ways of doing it. Hit the like button on each live broadcast and video. This helps the channel grow. Hit the subscribe button and select the all notifications bell so you don't miss a single show. If you want to help us financially, then you can join the channel using this button with the membership starting at $1.99 a month. Or you can drop us a donation in the chat using a super sticker. We're also looking for sponsors. If you'd like your brand advertised on the flies for the show and featured during the ad break, then email john at nufcmatters.com to arrange today. Manners with me, Steve Wraith. Welcome as well to uh, Joe Allen on the Joe Allen Show. How are you, Joe? Very good, Steve. Very good. Yourself? Very good, mate. Good to see you. And uh, you. looking ahead, of course, later on to uh, the Joe Allen Derby. Uh, uh, Chelsea versus Newcastle United at Stamford Bridge this weekend. Uh, more of that later, though. Let's look back, first of all, as we'll have all week on the uh, the game that we played last weekend, Joe, just to get your your views on it. Uh, Newcastle United nil, uh, Brighton won. Of course, we went into the game hoping that uh, we were going to keep our unbeaten home record going. It wasn't to be uh, a goal in the 35th minute from Danny Welbeck, uh, the only goal of the game. In a game which, it has to be said, was was one-sided. Newcastle United again dominating the game uh, from start to finish, but just not having any luck in front of the goal. 21 shots at goal. No goals uh, is the story of this one. Uh, five one-on-ones uh, for Isaac and for Anthony Gordon. Some slightly easier than others. Again, no goals. And uh, lots of talking points about this, Joe. But first of all, just get your opinion on on the goal itself, uh, on the game itself, sorry, and, and the, you know the, the fact that Newcastle are struggling for goals. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Steve, struggling for goals. I mean, um, I've looked at all the possession, and I'm, I'm sick of talking about possession, to tell you the truth, Steve, you know. Um, if you've got possession, it's pointless having it if you're not creating goals, you know. And I look straight away, um, you know, we've got a top scorer, is Harvey Barnes with three goals. Gordon's got two, and there's three others on one. You know, we've played eight games this season. I mean... Um, how we're in the position that we're in is quite remarkable, to tell you the truth. But for that to be your top goal scorers um, in this campaign up there now, you know, is uh, it's really poor, you know. And we know that these has been out. But, I mean, if there's one good thing to come out of it, because I'm, I'm not wanting to give the doom and gloom, 
So Isaac's come back. Right, he's had seven shots. I look at his game very, very closely, as I do all the time watching the, the forwards. And he's my only forward, so I'm pretty much uh, occupied with that one. But he's had seven shots at goal, and two of the chances, me as a forward and him as a finisher, I'm thinking he's scoring, you know. Um, and nine times out of ten, he would. Now, you can see he's been rusty because he's missed three games, what have you, and all that, and the tone, and, and what have you. But you don't miss your instinct, you know? And whether it's a, a bit of confidence or whatever, that, that's it's all well and above board. But when you have a look at who else is chipping in with the goals, you know, you, you're talking about Anthony Gordon, and there's a hell of a lot of pressure on his shoulders for him to score a goal. Uh, I mentioned Harvey Barnes. He's been a bit player. In the, in the side this season, you know, he's been in and out. Uh, and yet he's, he's top scorer with three, which that's there with, within lies the problem at scoring goals. I mean, we're, we're goals difference record now for being ninth in the table is nil, you know. And like you, you're having a look around and, and I'm worrying a little bit. Are we on this little slippery slope, you know, because we've got a tough game, like you said, coming up um, at the weekend. Um, but you've got like, you know, uh, looking wrong for where we're, I'm looking at the, at the team and I'm saying, where's there going to be a little bit of magic? Where are we going to create that little bit of magic that's going to get you the goal? You know, you, you're talking Nick Pope. He never touched the ball at 25 minutes, you know, and he had nothing to do. And, and well back, and I've got to say the goal, so disappointed with the goal that we conceded, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Isaac's chance and, Literally, off that chance, they've went up the park, they've played a wall pass, which schoolboy stuff to defend. And Welbach's got in and, and finished arguably very, very well and, and got a great goal. But could Tino Livermento have done more for me? Could Shaw have gotten closer for the for the one two? I mean, it's it's one ball up up front that's killed with. You know, and and it's proved to be the match winner, and it was a sucker punch. Yeah, you know, I can tell you, I can tell you, it was eighty percent because I looked at the possession at the time. And I thought, not a flame again, eighty percent, and yet we could have been one nil up. We could have also had a penalty kick, which for me was an absolute stone waller, Steve. VAR didn't get involved. Why that happened? This is what gets me about VAR. This is what gets my goat about what's going on in this game of football, you know. And it didn't... It was a stonewall penalty kick. There, and there. Ball. We could have been 2-0 up. Was, it, was that the ball, Joe, that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the handball. The handball yeah. that didn't even get looked at at VAR. You know, you were at the match, it didn't even get looked at at VAR. You know, mm -hmm. what's the point in having it? It was a stonewall penalty. But, you know, gripes and all the rest of it, you've done enough in that game with the chances you've just said that were missed. And there's got to be some more players without get, like the onus is obviously on the forwards to score goals, and and you look at that. But other players have got to stand up, you know, step up to the plate, you know. And I mean, going forward, I'm I'm thinking, right, how how we're going to unlock this Brighton defence? How are we going to get past them? We've got two fullbacks there. You mentioned Chelsea before. They've cost fifty million quid for two fullbacks, yeah, and that's without the add-ons. Now, I've looked. Not one of them's had an assist in any of the goals that we've scored. And, arguably, they haven't played all the games. But that's 50 million quid. And, yeah, the great on the ball and the great at, at making a pass forward and what have you, because they've been at Chelsea's Academy since they're 9, 10 year old. you know? That's what they learn at Chelsea's Academy. They're learning all the possession. They're learning how to, how to probe. About. They're not hurt. They're not knowing how to break down a defence that's as rigid what and as good at what Brighton's was marshalled by Dunk, who was outstanding for me, you know, for Brighton, as a lot of the Brighton players were. And, and just the mention you know, of Welbach, by the way, uh, we're very, very sorry to see him get injured. But I will, I will say one thing, Steve, for Newcastle United supporters, probably the only club in the country, bar Liverpool, that would have given Welbach, who scored against us, uh, stand innovation going off the pitch on the stretcher. And uh, honestly, so moving. And that just shows you the stamp of Newcastle United supporters. And I was yeah. proud to be a Geordie then, like um, all the time. But you know what? They stood up with the plate, the Newcastle fans were outstanding. 
But um, that aside, how we're going to break them down and what ideas is Eddie? I'm going to ask you, what ideas does Eddie do to, to change the game? How can we get somebody on, Steve, that's going to affect the game? Well, I thought the best player off the bench was Harvey Barnes. Um, I mean, the substitutions are, are things that you're going to look at, you know, and, and say that bench is strong enough to change the game. I thought Willock for Tonali was a strange one. I think Tonali should have stayed on. I don't think there was anything wrong with Tonali. Um, certainly didn't look injured, didn't look as if he was flagging, was pulling the strings. I think we would have got back into the game with Tonali on the pitch. I thought Willock came on and I thought he was ineffective. Um Certainly struggling uh, since he came back from injury and that back, you know, finding that kind of fitness level again and getting back into the game. Um, there's no doubt that when Willock played alongside Joe Linton last season when he was fit, that you know that they they've got a wonderful partnership together. But they're struggling at the moment to find that. Harvey Barnes for the first ten minutes changed the game. Uh, we didn't capitalise on it. He came on for Jacob Murphy. Um, Jacob Murphy's getting it in the neck from a lot of our supporters. Uh, but I think with Jacob Murphy, he's probably our best option on the right, with the exception of Barnes. Um, I would start Barnes on the right and Gordon on the left and, and swap them moving forward. That's what I would do. But clearly, Eddie doesn't fancy doing that at this moment in time. Almiron did what Almiron does, played with a smile on his face, ran around a lot, but was very ineffective. And it was 85 minutes when he came on and you know he had a little bit of extra time to play as well. But came on for Bruno who, you know, Bruno didn't have his best day. I've heard some people say they thought he was man of the match. I, I didn't see it. And um, he, he cut a frustrating figure as, as it, cut, cut a frustrating figure as he chucked the captain's armband at um, Joe Linton as he went off. Longstaff coming on in 85 minutes, never going to change the game. Uh, he came on for Gordon, which I think was probably just to give Gordon a bit of a rest, run himself into the ground as usual. Gordon just, as we know, didn't manage to finish anything. Um, but Longstaff isn't an impact player. He's not somebody who can come on and change things. And he came on, as I say, in the 85th minute. The last the last sub that was used was a Sula for Hall. It made sense taking Hall off because we had four or five minutes to try and get an equaliser. Um, you know, went with three up front. Uh, but no time at all for a Sula to get into the game. And, and you know, one one bright run and you know, touch from him, that that was all. So when you look at the players who were on the bench that weren't used, Kraft, well, he was never going to get used. Kelly, no. I mean, there was nothing wrong with our back four. That one lapse in concentration led to the goal. You're going to get that in the Premier League against a, a team like Brighton, who are an established Premier League season. Obviously, Vlakadimos, the, uh, the the goalkeeper, no need to bring him on. Lewis Miley, of course, was a welcome addition to the bench. Um, but again, Eddie will take his time with him. He's, he's literally just back in the squad from his injury, probably thought, you know, it's not probably best not to bring him into this occasion. But um, we should have had enough, Joe. That, that opening line of Pope in uh, goal, Tino Byrne, Shaw Hall at the back, Joe Linton, Bruno, Tonali, Murphy and Gordon and Isaac. Come on, man. And that, I mean, that team should have beaten Brighton. And the stats tell you that it should have as well. As I mentioned right at the top of the programme, 20, 21 shots um, and not one goal. So I mean, look, Joe, you get you get games like that. Um, we've had three on the trot now: Brighton, uh, Wimbledon, of course, and Everton. Um, you know, Newcastle shot shy in front of goal. How do you change it? Does does Eddie Howe go in? And I'll come on to something else after this. Does Eddie Howe go in this weekend? You know, order a little bit of extra shooting practice because that 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 in essence is all we're really missing from our game. You've been in this position before, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. I understand what you're saying. And you can you can train until you're blue in the face. But mm -hmm. football's a game of confidence, you know. And it's, you need a player to score a goal and that'll give the player a lift. And unfortunately, we haven't got many players to chop and change. Callum Wilson didn't even make the bench again. Um, so, you know, you're going to be pretty much sticking with the same side, I would have said, for the next game. And this just because... The one thing that did interest us, Steve... Our players that were on international duty, uh, yeah. albeit apart from Almiron, uh, played. Whereas I looked at Liverpool's team against Chelsea on Sunday and he rested um, their best midfield player, the Argentinian lad. I um, know. 
he was I listened to the interview before the game, Joe, and he was sick on the way back uh from his, on his flight. Um so he, he, the reason he didn't yeah. play McAllister was because... He might have been sick because because he didn't score and, and Messi scored three. Possibly, was six. Yeah. That's why but he, he might said have been sick. He took ill on the flight coming home, so it was a precaution leaving him on the bench. Mm. But then again, the Chelsea boy who's like Fernandez, the rave about, but um we'll come to him later. But he, he played most of the game and he got left out, you know. Uh, Tonali played, people, are, you know, straight away saying, oh, he's played too much too much football by playing two games in a week for Italy. You know, yeah. he's, been out, he's been out for a year. But at the same time, I thought it was a below par Tonali, to tell you the truth. I like him to be more effective forwardly. I want him to play in a more forward position. So yeah. I think he's a type of player you're asking us for, for answers for Eddie, you know. Put Tolly in a more forward position where he can affect the game. You know, he's got the great ability to affect the game. I looked at Bruno, you know, and you know, I thought he was indifferent, Bruno. And you have a look at his season compared to last season at the same stage. He's only had one assist in the, in the goals that we scored. And it's horrible when you're looking at stats like this because it's not like football, but you're looking for excuses half the time. You're looking for a reason why. And sometimes you just got to go, and, you know, lads, get out there. It's 11 against 11. Stuff all the tactics and all that. Horlicks, right? Just go out there. 11 against 11. Beat the player that you're playing against and do anything you've got to do to win a game. You know, because I don't want to get on this slidey slope of losing games. And we've got tough games coming up, you know. And it's a confidence game as well. And players to chop and change. I do think we need to strengthen in the transfer deadline, whatever's going on with the financial carry on. Where, about, do, where, where do we need to strengthen, Joe? A striker. We need a striker, right. another striker straight away, without a shadow of a doubt. We need a, a good striker, a striker that's going to get you goals. You know, we're not going to buy a striker and sit him on the bench like we did with young Osula. You know, it's, it's no good. We need somebody to come in and start shaking the boat a bit, you know, rocking it. Let's rock the boat, boys. Come on. We need a striker that's going to turn heads and, you know, and, and cause defences trouble and not get snuffed out in them games when you're crying out for a goal, you know, because we basically come up well short. We were well short of ideas and of plans to score that goal. That was to get her back in the game, not to win the game. You know? Yeah. What about set pieces, Joe? Uh, that was the other thing I wanted to speak to you about. I mean, it's frustrating for me watching Newcastle get a corner because ultimately I know it's either going to go out for a goal kick or go safely into the goalkeeper's arms. There was a stat flying around. I'm not 100% sure how accurate it is, but somebody said... We've had 186 corners since we last scored. I'm not sure if that's accurate, so we can't use that. But it feels like 186. That's what I'm going to say. Um, and I'm always surprised. Big Dan Byrne, um, when we get a corner, goes and stands in the box. And, and I remember my old football coach shouting and bawling at me, going, what are you standing there for, like a tin of milk? I mean, that was a centre-half on a Sunday, you know what I mean? And, and you've always had a run and jump, Joe. You know what I mean? You had a run and jump. You would start on the edge of the box. You would, you'd, you'd, you know, run one way, feign another, and then you'd get in the mixer. And you'd get your co your good corner taker would, you know, on the left or the right, you'd mix it up and he'd, he'd swing it out over towards you going in. And, you know, that was the way it was. That's the way it, that's the way it worked for me. And, I mean, it, listen, Eddie Howe's got the badges. Eddie Howe's uh, far more uh, of a manager than I'll be, um, you know, the, the basics of football don't change from Sunday League to, to Premier League. And, and what I'm saying is there just doesn't seem to be any invention. And I've said this all week and people might think I'm rabbiting on about it, but the stats are there. We, we don't score from corners and we're not scoring from free kicks, Joe. We, we brought Tenali in and there was this wonderful montage. And I know video YouTube montages can be made up over 10 years and they might have 10 great free kicks, which might have been one a year. But Tenali was brought in because of his because of the kind of player he was, but you can also take a free kick. We never use him on free kicks. We're always allowing other people to take them, but should we, should we be looking to improve our set pieces, Joe? I definitely should. I mean, it's a very, very important place to, to, 
catching goals, you know. I mean, and also crossing balls. I mean, how many times I saw we get the other side of the defender and you pull the ball back? You, you're pulling it back, you're not putting it in the box. You might argue there's only one in the box or what have you. So we'll get more players in the box. This is the idea. We're playing Isaac up front and he's on. You've got to be not leaving them isolated and what have you. I mean, set pieces, why, Steve? We used to work on them sometimes the day before games. It was a pain in the neck, you know, because once you've done your set pieces, the other team knew what you were going to do anyway. So it was like, you know, Billy, Billy Smart's circus, you know, half the time, some set pieces. <laughs> you, you, know, you threw the coin up and see what you got. But obviously movement is very, very important. I mean... If I've got me centre forward, I would be doing my job. I might as well work ticket, so I had to stand on either somebody's toes or stand running around the goalkeeper like a nutter in a circle around the goalkeeper, which was permitted in them days, back in the arc when I played and Beamish Museum had me boots. But um, it was permitted that to, to not ungently conduct to run around the goalkeeper, believe it or not, just to give him something to think about. And then you might get pushed or you might get knocked or whatever. He wasn't thinking about the ball. But the movement certainly from centre half. So if you've got the three big lads in your team, you'd have one going to the front post, spin to the back, the other one comes in behind him. I mean, every it was like, you know, strictly come dancing if you like. If you're Paul Nurse and you're easily gonna get voted off, you know, or you're gonna get found out. But at the end of the day, um, it's down to Eddie and these these tactical coaches to put that into place. I can imagine the players, you know, if, if you will see that they're not coming up with any new ideas. So if you can see that and your supporter armchair that you got every game, you see everything, you see it probably more than more. right in them. Right in them because he's not getting any interviews for England. You know, that. <laughs> there's no interviews for Eddie at England. Apparently, there's been 10 interviews that for the England job. Now, I've just worked out, by the way. Can you name us the 10 players that's getting, uh, the 10 it's managers that's getting interviews? Because I've just looked at the top of the Premier League, by the way. And this is another reason. Apart from Eddie in the top 10, we've got Sean Dyche. I know I'm ranting here, but here we go. We've got Sean Dyche, right, at Everton. He's English. We've got the boy at Southampton. He's English. We've got him at Ipswich, who's Irish. And we've got Leicester's manager, who's Welsh. So, at the top of the championship, there's one manager, I think, it's Chris Wilder, Sheffield United, oh, and all the rest of them are foreign. All the rest of them are foreign. Yeah, well, you've screwed your face up. I'm saying, as an up-and-coming English manager, apart from Eddie Howe, who was getting interviewed? I mean, you know, I would like to, I would like to know who got these 10 interviews for the England job. We've got to take Eddie at face value. He said he wasn't interviewed, and um, we'll let him have that. Um, but I think he had his fingers crossed. I would be surprised if he wasn't at least contacted, but we'll never know. It let, we've got to leave that in the past, I guess. And will it rear its head again? Will Eddie be here if it rears its head again? Tuchel's got 18 months. Will he last that um, is the big question. But... Eddie certainly would like the England job in the future. I've got no doubt about that. But for now, he's at Newcastle. But, you know, as we go through this season, with a lack of investment in three previous windows in the right areas, Newcastle are going to struggle. And we've, we've got all kinds coming out. We've got the, the the WhatsApp messages that have come out this week on a, you know from, from Perth private uh, WhatsApp messages uh, during the takeover. Of course, that means that the whole... Was the takeover, you know, legal and and you know should should um should the Saudis have been allowed to take over the club with what become you know with, with what's come out? We've had all of that this week, and it's been you know for me it's been a, an absolute car crash of a week again, you know, which has culminated in a in a defeat as well. The one bit of bright news we've had, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about this before we go to the ad break, is that Anthony Gordon has, has signed a new contract, uh, Joe. Um, obviously, that news came out on Tuesday. Uh, you've had time to digest it a little bit. What's you know, what's your views on that? Gr pleased to see the the kid commit his future to Newcastle. The interview, he said he loved it and he wants to win something here, which is which is you know great to hear. He's paramount for this football club, Steve. You know, Anthony Gordon. It's been arguably one of our best signings, even though at 45 million it wasn't cheap. 
But has he proven that forty-five million price tag without a shadow of a doubt? Will he play for England with it for the next five years? In my opinion, if he gets the right manager working how he can play at the top of his form, he's, a, he's an England regular for me. And the fact that he's come out and said he loves Tyneside and he loves being in the North East, his family is settled here. It's just a brilliant, brilliant acquisition to keep him at the club for longer because I would like to know if Liverpool, and there's been this talk, like you say, um, we're, we're going to come, he was going to sign for Liverpool. Um, how much were Liverpool going to pay for Anthony Gordon? to take them away from St James's Park because I, I wouldn't have seen anything less than 70 million for him. And is he worth 70 million? I think in my opinion is if we had to replace Anthony Gordon, you'd be looking to pay 70 million to replace him. So I think it's a wonderful sign and, and he's got a great attitude and he's a great player and he can still have an indifferent game if you like and still be one of Newcastle's best players. And he didn't by all accounts. He, he'll admit himself have the best game at the weekend, you know. But he was still there to miss the chances. He was there getting the chances to miss them. And his all-round game was excellent, you know. And, and then another day, he'd have scored a goal. Um, but in the whole, massive that he's, he's stopping at Newcastle United. And I just think it's, that's the best bit of business I've heard for Newcastle United this week. I'm going to ask you a question. Nowadays, are, are contracts worth the paper they're written on, Joe? Not a, not a being. Not a bean. If somebody comes in, the end of the day, it's always between the club and the player is regarding defending each other. But if the right money come in for the right player and the right money was shown to that player, trust us, that, that contract wouldn't be worth, honestly, chicken feed. Chicken feed, uh, says Joe. Uh, you used to do your own uh, negotiations, didn't you, Joe? You, you, didn't have an, you didn't have an agent. I was brilliant. Honestly, I was brilliant. Even at the at the end with Ken Bates, right? I getting everything and, and more what I wanted. It was unbelievable because it was just me there, so I didn't have to pay the agent because I was my agent. And at the end, I turned around to him and I said, uh, "Just one other thing, Chairman." I said, "You you watch." He went, "Yeah, yeah." He says, "Rolex." I says, "Oh, it's lovely that." I says, "Can I have one of them as well?" And he went, "No, you bl you cheeky." He says, "If you score a goal on your debut, I'll get you one of them watches." Good job of scoring against Wimbledon on his debut, you want it? <laughs> Quick ad break, back after this. A big thanks to all our sponsors, Skips and Bins. You can find them at their website, skipsandbins.com. Contact them, www.skipsandbins.com forward slash contact. Say hello to low-cost waste disposal with pay-as-you-go and contract waste management. A big thanks to Mr. Vicky Sources, handmade in Cumbria. You can contact them at their website, mrvickies.co.uk, email info at mrvickies.co.uk or telephone 01768 210102. A big thanks to our NUFC Matters fanzine sponsor, United Group Travel. They are the Travel and Tourism Award winners 2024. Two crew driver and courier, local family company, three star plus quality hotels and no interchanges. All excursions included, contact them at their website, www.unitedgrouptravel.com, email beverly.ugtl at gmail.com or telephone 01670 632 460 or mobile 0791 666 4174. There are no strangers on our tours, just friends you haven't met yet. A big thanks to Media Arts for all the technical side of things. And don't forget, we are also a podcast and you can find us on iTunes, Spotify or other podcast providers. If you want to help the channel, you can hit the like button, which is the little thumb under each video. You can click the share button to share your other social media or subscribe to the channel. Hit the subscribe button and it is for free. We still do seven shows a week. Hit the join button and you can join the channel for $1.99 a month to help support us. We do promote events on this channel. Derek Wright is holding his official book launch at the Tyneside Irish Centre. 15th of November, tickets are £22 and that does include a signed book. Tickets are from newcastlelegends.com. Gold Star Promotions and Gateshead Leisure Centre are bringing Lennox Lewis to the area as part of his UK tour. You can get tickets by calling 0191 250 5066. Tickets start at £39.
The Long Sands are back in aid of Dementia Matters and being supported by Lilac Lane and the Chris Norris Band. Saturday, January the 4th, 2025. Tickets £15 from NewcastleLegends.com or from the Clooney box office. Peter Beardsley will be at the Tyneside Irish Centre on the 10th of January, 2025. Tickets are available from NewcastleLegends.com or from Woucher. An evening with the entertainers takes place at the Town Theatre and Opera House, the 24th of January, 2025. You can buy tickets for that now from the box office, 0844 249 1000, or from the website, timetheatreandoperahouse.uk. And the Magpie Lounge is now open at Gateshead Leisure Centre. Seven tokens for £99. Call 0191 250 5066 to book your tickets today. And the first of those tokens will be the 31st of January, an evening with Lee Clark. If you just want to buy tickets separately, call 0191 250 5066. And the book everyone's talking about, The Entertainers, 1992 to 1997, Kevin Keegan's Legacy, is on sale now. The book will be posted out on the 1st of December, written by Will Scott, over 30 contributors to this book. NewcastleLegends.com or Amazon to buy it today. Welcome back to the Joe Allen Show on NUFC Matters. And uh, we were talking about the, uh, the the defeat against Brighton uh, last weekend. And I uh, just want to talk about refereeing. Um, you, you've had your say on VAR, Joe, but Peter Banks was the referee. It was his second game in charge of a Newcastle fixture. I'll be happy if we don't see him again. That's two defeats now. Uh, he was obviously in charge of the 3-1 defeat at Fulham in September. Um, I don't think you have anything controversial to decide other than the penalty, which you've already discussed. Mm. I thought it was a totally inept performance, again, from this referee. And I genuinely mean this when I say I think he'd be out of his depth referee in Sunday League. Um, he, he really, really was making a run for his own back at times. He punished petty misdemeanours on the pitch. Um, and... He's another one of those referees that I would say is a non-decision maker. And he literally is, he's a, he's a person who now, a referee who now relies on his earpiece. Um, he, he'd rather wait to hear what VAR have to say and the VAR referees and officials than make the decision himself. And I just think he had an absolute stinker. And I think the standard of refereeing, Joe, is, is, is pretty poor at the minute. There's a, there's a few like that, Steve, to tell you the truth, you know. I mean, um, I don't know whether they're under that much pressure and scrutiny that they're, they're doing the earpiece, but they're certainly getting away from refereeing the players that's on the park, you know, and being the man in charge, if you like. I mean, half the time, you can't even talk to a referee now these days. You can't, you know, you, they're telling you to, to go away and all the rest of it um, and that the captain's got to do your speaking for you. I mean, it's there's that many rules and stimulations now. I think we should get our very good mate, uh, none other than Mr. Stephen Howie, uh, who was referee's assessor for a long, long time at the Premier League, uh, and get his thoughts on it, and, and that'll be interesting to find out. Um, but, you know, like, at the end of the day, there has been that, that gulf, if you like, um, between the players and the referees having a relationship you know, and I mean, that'll never come back, I don't think, you know. Um, there's, a, I mean, yes, back in the day, you could call a ref this, that and the other, and they'd give you as much back, and you had total respect for the referee. You know, he was never, ever in danger or anything like that. But now it is, it's like, it's as if the common sense has gone out the game. I think that's what you're getting at. I mean, just common sense decisions, you know. I mean, Welbeck went down in that incident, and yet he seemed to be the only one for me, that was genuinely in distress and he was saying that he was struggling. I, I noticed, I was watching him, I was watching his mannerisms, you know, I was watching on the telly and, he, and he's waving about like, and, he, and he, was in, he was really struggling and it just goes to prove the lad had to come off with oxygen on his face, you know? So that was, it was a bad injury whereas the referees, they're not thinking, well, I'm not saying and suggesting for one minute he didn't have well backs. Welbeck's um, health at heart, you know? But yeah. at the end of the day, 
I'm on about relationships with the players and the referee. It's like you used to know your players, you used to know your referees, you used to know the ones you could get away with things with, you know, and you used to know that if you if you didn't tow the line with some referees, they were going to be like the worst headmaster you've ever had, you know. And nowadays, they've just got no personality, I don't think. You know, even the... I mean, you're crying out for a, a Jeff Winter just to have a little bit of personality because, I mean, let's face it, he only loved Man United and, and Middlesbrough, didn't he? At the end of the yeah. Day. I mean, look, referees, as you say, we had some right characters. Um, we had some who thought they were bigger than the game, of course. They, they, you know, Mike Dean, um, Uriah Rennie spring to mind. And, you know, um, you, you go back, the, the first referee I ever remember was Trelford Mills for the wrong reasons, for disallowing <laughs> those goals in the FA Cup against Brighton there. Yeah, was that the game, about- Steve? I've never let that go. Never let that go. Um, yeah, how he would have coped with VR, I wonder. But yeah, it was interesting. I just wanted to know what your views were about that. And, um, you know, that yeah, we just got to get on with it. Um, you know, the, the, the main thing is that, uh, you know, that there is bad for everybody, I guess. Um, I, will t- I will tell you the one about Uriah Rennie in one of his early games. Go on. I was, I was playing at Hartlepool and um, obviously, you know, you have to go to the bathroom sometimes as a player. And yeah. lower down the divisions, there's only usually one uh, facility, if you know what I mean, where there's usually a little bit of reading matter on the floor. Right. You know, in the, in the shape of a, a match day program. So anyway, as having a good pre-match meal and, and doing what good racehorses do before they go out and run, I needed to, to use the loop. And I uh, picked up the program and it said uh, Uriah Rennie Sheffield. And I thought, oh, that's a funny old name, isn't it? Uh, and I read his um, pen pal, whatever it's uh, Ryan, born in Sheffield, blah blah blah. And I, I went all the way down. Favorite food was steak, and uh, his favorite drink, orange juice. I thought, oh god, it's a teetotal referee. We well, can't have them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've got his, his likes and the hobbies, and it was uh, Uriah. I like to uh, perform. A martial art called karate, at which I am a fourth dan black belt in, and also have a black belt in karate. And I went, and judo, sorry. And what? And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, he's a black belt in judo and a black belt in karate. There's no way I'm going to call him out on the middle of the park, am I? He could have, <laughs> he could have folded us into a duck. <laughs> Ah, dear Leo. Yeah, you're right. Any, uh, the man to send Shearer off. That's what he'll always be remembered for. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Chelsea away this uh, this weekend and Newcastle United will play their first part of the League and Cup double header uh, tomorrow on Sunday when they visit Stamford Bridge for a Premier League fixture. It's a two o'clock kickoff. It is live on Sky Sports and, as you would imagine, all 3,000 tickets uh, that have been allocated to Newcastle United have been sold. Uh, don't forget the away ticket transfer scheme will operate. Your details can be found on the club website. Uh, as we're pre-recording this show, um, slightly ahead of uh, the game, we uh, don't have the team news, but we do know that Callum Wilson may be uh, fit to return. He could have played last week, I think, but they decided to keep him for this game and potentially the cup game. Uh, and he will return to the squad for the first time this season. Kieran Trippier is still out, as are Sven Botman and Jamal Lascelles. The availability of Matt Target isn't currently known yet. Big news uh, on the suspension front, of course, is that Joe Linton managed to avoid a booking last weekend, uh, but that means he goes into this game with Dan Byrne, both on one booking away from an automatic one-match suspension. Uh, Chelsea, uh, well, they were in uh, Europa Conference action against Panathinaikos in Greece. And as this has been pre-recorded, uh, we don't know what the result of that was. So uh, from our perspective, uh, Newcastle had a week off to prepare for this game. The referee is Simon Hooper. It's uh, first Magpie appointment of the season for the Wiltshire-based official. Uh, his most recent site uh, in, in a Newcastle game came in last season's end-of-season game against Brentford. That was a 4-2 win. And he also took charge of our 4-2 home victory over Chelsea in November 2023. And on VAR, it is the best a man can get. It is Jared Gillette. Uh, Let's hope we don't need to rely too heavily on VAR uh, at Chelsea. So uh, 
Back to your old club, Joe. Um, you know, Chelsea's a, a tough place to go, but they've been a little bit... How can I put it? They've been a bit in and out this season, haven't they? You know, bearing in mind that the players that they have at their, uh, you know, you know, in their squad, um, obviously from from our point of view, is it a good time to go and play them? Do you think? Well, I would have said it after seeing um, the Liverpool game where they lost, obviously uh, last Sunday, but Chelsea played really well, Steve. Chelsea mm -hmm. Chelsea put a, a magnificent performance and were very very unlucky, uh, which worries us. Again, we're coming back to goal scorers. I look, you know, and Cole Palmer, he's got six. You've got Jackson, the centre forward, who's got five. You know, you've got the winger, who's got four. Manduki, you'll pronounce it better than me. Um, Money. That's him. And, um, you know, <laughs> you, you look at that there, and all of a sudden, you've got 15 goals from three players. And that's without anybody else chipping in. You know, so Chelsea can score goals, as proven. You look at ours, which we said before, top score were three and Harvey Barnes. And, and you know, unlikely to play. I hope he does play. I hope Eddie takes your point of view. I think it's a great idea to put Harvey Barnes starting and then swapping with Gordon. In it. You know, that, that's that's allowed. Of course it's allowed. I think it's a great idea. But if not, if Jacob starts the game uh, and, it, and it's not going well, have that up your sleeve for the second half, maybe. And the Callum Wilson as well, which, you know, you've got to go in there not wanting to come away with just a point. You've got to play Chelsea at their own game, you know, because they have let in goals at Stamford Bridge this season. I mean, they've let in goals, um, I believe that they're letting two against Brighton uh, in the first half in one of the games. Um, so the, the defence is, is there for all to see, but you, you can't go there and sit back because attacking-wise, like I've just said, He's been voted the best player in the Premier League. In my opinion, he's up there. He's definitely up there. Uh, in Cole Palmer, I think he's a revelation. Yet, these two international appearances he's had just recently, by his standards, he was really, really poor, you know. Um, but on his day, he's a match winner. Yeah, you know, and uh, this is this is thing coming to Stamford Bridge. Uh, this, this is a tough te a team to play at home. Uh, so we've got to go in there positively, you know, we haven't got to be frightened because like you say, there's three games to play against them in a short space of time uh, with the two cup games, but you don't know what side they're going to put up in the cup, but we're not bothered about that. Let's just get the first game out of the way. Let's go in there, you know, not wanting, obviously every team goes in there not wanting to lose game, but don't play in a way that you, you're wanting to just come out there with a point, you're going to be negative. You've got to play Chelsea positively because if you play them negatively, they will walk all over you. Does it make it more difficult that the two teams have got to meet twice in the matter of days? You know, I mean, this this kind of quirk happens now and again, you know, but will, you know, will that make it more difficult to set up? Um, you know, it's two completely different games, two completely different competitions, but, you know... It'll be, hmm. Yes, it'll be two different sides, Steve. You yeah. can guarantee Chelsea, Chelsea with the, the abundance that they've got in, in riches with their squad, they'll play yeah. a totally different team altogether, especially after the European game that you've mentioned before. Yeah. Um, so that, that's where their squad will come into play. Our squad for the League Cup game, I mean, obviously we've got to get past this one first, but I don't know what intentions Eddie's got. Is this mm. our best? I mean, I'll ask you. You've been long-suffering like me. We haven't won out since the first Cup. You know, um, it's it's. Do you want to win this cup? Can we yes. get through the final? Yes, we can get through the final if we play with strongest team in every round. So, you know, for me, I always want to see a Newcastle team that goes out to win. But I'd love to see them play the strongest team, home and away in these next two games. Yeah, I, I mean, this cup is the cup to win. You know, this is the cup the Manchester City won before they went off on their wonderful run. Um, I just hope the distractions off the pitch, you know, the uh, you know the, the, the situations that we've had, uh, don't start to seep in again because it that, that we've had a stop-start season with 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 meddling press 
uh, stories and, and that, that it is unhelpful. It does unsettle people. And, uh, you know, that the headlines that we've seen this week about, you know, tuning in trouble with, you know, the, the messages that have been leaked and this, that and the other. Hopefully nothing nothing comes of it. But, you know, from our perspective, you can't help as a fan but, but be concerned when you see stories like that. And you just wonder what kind of negative effect that has, like, in the squad. Um, OK, I'll, we're obviously going to be back on air before the Cup game. So we'll just focus on the league game. Uh, Joe, um, prediction. Well, you know, it's it's a tough one to call this, isn't it? But what what would you what would you expect out of this game? I I'll tell you where I stand. I I personally think, having been to watch Newcastle at Chelsea over the last few seasons, this is the one place, other than Spurs, where I always feel we can get something, and nothing's changed. Um, I still think we need to discover our scoring boots, and at some point we will. Um, we always go through a, a little bad spell, but at some point we will. I don't think it'll be this weekend, but I do think Newcastle United will score at Chelsea. And I think our back four is capable of keeping it relatively tight. So I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw at Chelsea. I think we'll discover our scoring boots. I think we'll, we'll, score, we'll score a goal from open play and I think we'll get a 1-1 draw. But I think it'll be tight. Um, but I think Newcastle will get a point, which I think will be considered a really good result. Yeah, it'll be a great result, a point. And I'll take a point, Steve. I'll go along with you at the 1-1 draw. What I will say is, though, uh, Chelsea score goals. It's, it's proven, you know, just by them three players that scored 15 goals already this season. So they're going to come at you. So also, it's all right having that good defence, but can that defence take the bombardment for 90 minutes? You've got to attack them. You've got to play Chelsea yeah. at their game. You know? You've got to play them at their own game. Because honestly, you'd be chicken fodder if you go there and just think you can defend and come back. You know, Maybe he's nicking a goal. Yeah, I'd love to think that. Um, and I'd love for it to get a draw. But you know, let's face it, I've never, ever went against Newcastle United, as we're saying, that we're going to get beaten. I'm not going to start now. So, I'll just prove you, because you said 1-1. One, one. I'm yeah. going for a 1-0 win. And everything I've just said was a total lie about Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> well, last season, it was an open game. Newcastle went for it. They ended up coming out um, losers on a, in a 5 goal thriller. Uh, Isaac and Murphy scored. But the two previous seasons, uh, obviously the um, 1-1 draw, uh, but that played them twice in the 1-1 draw in that game where Kieran Trippier dropped the rick. Uh, we lost 4-2 on penalties. Um, we drew 1-1 in the league, Anthony Gordon scored. Previous visits uh, before that, two um, two defeats, a 1-0 reverse and a 2-0 reverse. Um, in fact, three three consecutive years, another 1-0 reverse. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not been a happy hunting ground, but performances-wise, from... A Newcastle fans perspective we've always we've always managed to put in a, a performance down there in recent years so I am still going for that yeah 1-1 one, one. Um, we will wait and see uh, what happens and we'll talk about the cup game next week got about 10 minutes left Joe I just want to talk about how the Premier League's shaping up with you um, let's look at the let's look at the bottom of the table first and the bottom three are Wolves Southampton and Palace Um Ipswich are hovering around there. They're only a point out of the relegation zone. Then there's a gap, um, quite a significant gap at this stage of the season, a five-point gap between Palace, who are third bottom, and Everton, uh, who are on eight points. Um, the way it's shaping up at the bottom, has it surprised you? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, they always say the three teams that get promoted are going to be the three teams that are under severe pressure. And when you're finding Crystal Palace in amongst that, after, um, you know, they've spent quite a lot of money, Crystal Palace, when you get a look at it, you know, and you've got that Mateta who was firing all cylinders last year, who isn't producing, he can't even get in the start in 11. He played against Nottingham Forest in the week um, and he was only on the bench, you know, and Ezzy has got nowhere near his form of last season since... Um, playing for England as well, you know, and being in the England squad. I think everybody's got international hangovers, you know. This lad's not looked... Uh, he's looked a shadow of himself, you know. So, Palace are getting drawn into that. Ipswich, everybody's thinking, oh, they've had a, a great start of the season and well done and they're playing good at football and they just got beat by this goal and they just lost by that goal and whatever. But the, the fact is, they've only got four points, you know, and that, and that gap that you're on about now, you've seen Everton, who, you know... 
you see a resurgence under Sean Dice. He's a miracle worker. The lad's done brilliant, you know. Hey, if there was ever a lad that wears his heart in his sleeve, and w give him an interview for the England job, you know. He's an English through and through. He's a, he's a young-ish manager. But you know what? His passion and to get a winning side out of some of rubbish, he's done pretty much at Everton and all his tenure that he's had there. You know, and Everton, and and they've done it on the on the space, Steve, of a win and a draw, and that four points just catapults you. If the other teams are losing, and they're getting stuck on the ones and the twos, and like Ipswich on the four, them three four points that you're getting in a, in a couple of games, you know, it's no good having the three draws like Ipswich to get them three points, or you know, the four draws or whatever. You know, the, the win and the draw catapults you and sticking you into that uh, little run that gets you the space between the relegation midst and the middle of the table. You might think, oh, it's a little bit too early to be talking about relegation. Yeah. The, the season starts after the first game. You know, the, there's a quarter of the season gone up there now. You know, and like you're thinking about it, all of a sudden it's going to be Christmas you get the games coming thick and fast over Christmas and New Year, and it'll shape itself up. The one thing I will say, Steve, I was taken aback a bit when one of the uh, the media turned around and said, uh, and this is Newcastle United, uh, it's the first time they've been beaten at St. James's Park in a year. And I was thinking, what? Uh, and I've been hopping on for months now about St. James's being a fortress. And then I, I looked at the year, and yeah, it was in January, so it was started in January. So you've got January, you know, February, March and April. In that time, there was an international break and Newcastle United played more away games than they played home games. Then you've got, like, after May, coming towards the end of the season, you've got international break before they went on to play in the Euros. Yeah. So you think of all the Euros and there's a tournament and then the season starts at the middle to end of August and then all of a sudden we're in October and basically that year that we've been unbeaten working out is probably closer to about five months you know and in that five months you've had away games to play as well you know so you know it's a false sense of security but we have just getting beat at St James's Park once which is the, the great stat now if you keep that going as regarding we're ninth in the table now, and I think you're going to come to that. But that that bottom to middle, get the gap there. I'm not talking relegation, but hang on to the shirt tails of them that's up the top because they're not a million miles away. You there's know, no middle. There's no. You know what, Joe? I've said this before. There's no middle anymore. There used to be a top, a middle, and a bottom of the Premier League. But yeah. now, and this, I think this is the point you're trying to make. Yeah. There's a top. There's a top and a bottom. Um, and, and I thought I was them. eloquently. Oh, I was making it eloquently to tell you the truth. But, thanks. but you are. But you are. But you are. You are right because literally those teams, and and I include the likes of Brighton in that, um, Fulham, Bournemouth, there, Brentford. Those are the teams that literally, if you drop your standards in a game at any time, they can take advantage. And that's what we've got now. Um, teams literally that can beat you, and they can beat Man United. They can beat Man City. They can beat Arsenal. They can beat Liverpool. They can beat Newcastle United. And we can all beat each other. So now it's become a lot tighter. And we're not seeing teams such as Man City and Liverpool and Arsenal running away with the league anymore. And it, at the moment, the one team that looks like it's closing the gap on the so-called top six and even leapfrogging some of the so-called top six is Aston Villa. I, I, we were hoping it was going to be us. But at the moment, Aston Villa are in that kind of in that kind of form, sitting for seventeen points. But we're only five points behind them. And if we if we start finding them a goal scorer and boots, you know Newcastle will be back up there. So it it's so tight, Joe. Yeah, Villa, Villa have done brilliant. But I just mentioned before, and I don't want to put any jinx on the Chelsea game. But the way I've seen Chelsea turn it round in the last mm -hmm. few weeks, they're they're coming, and the, this manager. Marescu that they got from Leicester, he's a very, very good manager. I don't know if people realise, but he was a long-time number two to Pep Guardiola. Yeah. 
you know. So he, he's not a mug in as it comes management, and he, he's done his apprenticeship, if you like. Mm. And and it, everybody knows at Chelsea that he's the boss, and they're coming with a, on the slipstream. Chelsea are getting up there. Nottingham Forest have done remarkably well, oh, and wow. that's that's the thing where you just mentioned teams can go anywhere and beat anywhere. Who would have, in the light of day said that Nottingham Forest would beat Liverpool at Anfield? I yeah. mean, last time that happened, Noah had his arc, you know? <laughs> and, I mean, it was that old. The boots were on there as well. I think the other boots were on there, the arc. Chris Wood, Chris Wood feels and great. And every team can beat any team like that. And, uh, and yet, yeah, you're looking at that and the top sides aren't running away with it. I mean, Man City last week, when you think about it, Wolves were so desperately unlucky. Again, 96 minutes, they've scored the goal, Man City. And uh, I, I loved what Gary O'Neill said. Um, he turned around and he said, well, we were, we were brilliant against the best team in the world for 95 minutes. Next time, we'll have to do it for 96, you know. Yeah. Great stuff. Great show. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, it has been a pre-recorded show, but I'm sure you've all had fun in the chat. Uh, Joe and I will be uh, back again next week and uh, we will probably do the show either Tuesday or Wednesday uh, because obviously Newcastle have got the cup game so I'll need to uh, rearrange things for next week but uh, looking forward to getting you back on then Joe and uh, don't forget as well we do do BigUp.com uh, you can find our previous shows on there BigUp.com forward slash NUFC matters but for now Joe thanks very much take care see you next week pleasure Steve thanks uh -huh.